Oh, it's our pleasure to go straight to Leeds across the pond. Jesse Marsh on Extra Time 1v1 as we prepare for the World Cup. Jesse, what's up, man? What's up, Andrew? How are you, man? It's been a long time. It has been a long time. It's interesting that ahead of a World Cup, we're chatting once again. I still think back all the way to 2014. Uh, but I have to start you with the topic that is not relevant in any way to soccer in any form. And that is that we've been talking about our favorite hot sandwiches on Extra Time. And it's come to my attention that you have some interesting dietary preferences, thanks to your Wisconsin upbringing, you know, Midwest, okay. I know how it goes. Yeah. What on earth is a cannibal sandwich, and under one cer what okay. circumstances would you ever consume such a thing, let alone multiple times? Never, never, ever. So you know when you get the raw meat, and then they I have don't. like, on on okay, so they give you the raw beef, and then you have uh, fresh onions, cut onions, and salt and pepper, and they give you little pumpernickel bread, and you you put that on to your bread, and then you eat the raw beef right there. Now, I don't eat that at all. Oh, okay. It's also, it's also a German and Austrian delicacy. I think that it was imported from those countries to uh, to Wisconsin, but that yeah. is a cannibal sandwich. Okay, I thought you know I was told by Twitter you can never trust what you hear on Twitter that this is something that either you were a fan of or had consumed, but. Sounds like it's Never outside your wheelhouse. It. Okay. No, it, make, it makes me want to puke. <laughs> uh, okay, how about this? What's, before we get to the soccer, we have a ton to talk about there between this Liverpool win and Leeds and the USMNT. What is your favorite hot sandwich, just for the record? Probably from my time at Princeton University, I grew very fond of the chicken parm sandwich. So I gained my freshman 15 on, on mostly chicken parms. So, yeah, I haven't had one in a while, but that's what I, that would be my go-to. All right, put it on the board. Jesse Marsh's okay. favorite hot sandwich. It's there for posterity. Uh, let's Good. talk soccer. Do you go yeah. into a fugue state after goals are scored? Or are you aware of the motions that your hands and your body is making? I'm just, <laughs> just curious. Because that Liverpool celebration, I was like, you know, what is this? And I, I was thinking Marty McFly playing the guitar on stage a little bit. And then a little bit of Ali G as well. So I don't know where that comes from or whether you know where that comes from. I don't really know where it came from. Um... Uh, at the moment, sometimes I've had, you know, last time I was at Anfield is when after we scored our third goal, I ran down to the corner, which I I've never done either. So I think maybe there's something about being at Anfield that brings out probably the worst. <laughs> the worst in me. <laughs> What's the high so, like? What is that high like? Like internally, emotionally? Yeah. What's I mean, the experience that? The prem is the prem is intense. It's um, every game is full of challenges and impossibilities. Um, you know the the preparation that goes into it, the the emotion, the, the the pressure, the investment that you make as a person and as a as a professional is at the highest level of anything I've ever experienced. So. You know, when you have these special moments in Brentford, when we when we scored in, in extra time, I fell to the ground. I didn't even realize I was on the ground until people were hugging me. So, you know, some of these times, um, you know, when 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 you know that the moment has major gravity, um, you you react in ways that that you you were not really sure why you did those things. You're not always proud of what you did, but. You know, that's what I think um, is special about being in this situation. I was going to ask you, and you, I think you've answered the question, what is your sort of like familial uh, reference point to the Premier League, the English Premier League, the Prem, but you seem to be a Prem guy. How did you settle on that? Well, you know, one of the things is in the U.S., a lot of, say, a lot of times we say Prem. Uh, here you say Premier it, League. Yeah. Yeah. At, at home, it's Premier League. Ah, uh, okay. Right? But you kind of have to say Premier League when you're here in, in England because that's how everybody references and says that word. Um, so often I just go with the Prem a lot because then I don't have to worry about am I saying it correctly or not. I saw you going through that mental switch. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's easy yeah. to mess that up. It's it used to, to be German up. and English, and now it's 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 the Queen's English, or now the King's English, and 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 our English. Ah, uh, we're code switching a lot these days for Jesse. That's yeah. what happens when you bounce around the world uh, coaching soccer. Yeah. Let me ask you just straight up: Was that Liverpool win the biggest of your coaching career? I mean, it was. You know, I didn't even realize how hard it was to win there until after the match. Someone said to me, with fans in the stadium, that they hadn't lost there since April twenty third, two thousand seventeen. And that Van Dyke had never lost a Premier League 
uh, match at home. Um, so, you know, we knew it was going to take a Herculean effort and, a, and, a, and almost a perfect match from us. But um, I guess afterwards you, you, you felt the gravity even more, the moment even more. Yeah, I mean, it was big. I mean, it was a big moment. I, I, I've had I've been lucky enough to, to have a career full of special moments um, and hopefully there'll be many more. But, you know, again, being here in England, there's so many challenges for someone like me in this moment. And and certainly after the run we'd been on of not finding ways to win and finding more ways to lose, it was important to get that win. And, and especially at that place. What's Anfield like? Experience yeah, it's on cool. the sideline. It, it, it's, you know, I mean, you know, there's the, there's the never walk alone that the crowd is all invested in. Um, so before the match, when you walk out there, you know, when, right before kickoff, you feel that energy. Um, I, I've been there only for two night games and I can say, people always say that Anfield at night is really special. Um, and I, I, you know, the, when you, when you pull up to the stadium, it, there's fans everywhere lining the, the road where the bus comes in. Um, you know, so it is really special. I, I I still prefer Ellen Road. I think it's, I think for me, the two best experiences I've had in the Premier League so far are, are Anfield and Ellen Road. Uh, so when you play at home at our place, there's also a type of energy in an old type stadium that that is very rare to experience anymore in England. So um, that's not pandering. That's that's my <laughs> actual opinion. Um, so yeah, but yeah, it was. It's always fun, and when you get ready for games like that. So you mentioned the emotional side of things, and that's something I've been thinking about watching you, watching Tyler, watching Brendan, just watching the league over the course of a long period of time. It just seems like an emotional drain in the Prem. I'm going to copy you on that one. Just You said it. Everything goes into every single moment, and you sort of live and die by that. We saw the positive side of it. There's the other side as well. You had the four-game losing streak here, two months or whatever it was without a win, very English uh, phrase here. The bookmaker's favorite to be sacked was Jesse Marsh. How did you manage... And how are you managing sort of the roller coaster of emotions and not just emotions, but the, the intensity of the emotions in your own life and sort of psyche day to day? Yeah. Well, I think in, you know, one of the benefits is that I, I have like a career behind me now of experiences, both as a player and as a, as a manager. And so um, you draw on that, you know, I mean, we've all been through good times and, and bad times. I, I even said publicly the, the week leading up to Liverpool I, in my career, I'd never experienced so much losing in, in a in a in a row. And so I had to, you know, dig deep and, and make sure that I stayed strong and, and continue to show belief to the team. Um, you know, I have great support here from the from the investment group, from from our chairman, from our sport director. Um, and then the team is fantastic to work with, even Last year, when I first came in, the the quality of people that we have in our that are our players is the highest I've ever had, and and they've been through a lot over a short amount of time. Whether it's the demands of what Marcelo Bielsa was to to then what the situation of of the relegation uh, moment last year was, or now the moment that we've been in here. So it's not easy being. Uh, uh, a member of Leeds United. Um, they say here all the time that we do it the hard way. Uh, and I guess I'm, I'm picking up on that more and more. But we believe in what we're doing. Uh, I think that's the underlying theme is we really as a group are, are united and we believe in, the, in the, the movement, in the progress. We believe in the project. And we just try to commit to it and to each other every day at the highest level. And we know, we believe that if we do that well every day, that it will lead us to success. Uh, so, yeah, that's how I feel about it. Do you compartmentalize it all? Like, how do you, I mean, I, I hear like to. Brendan, he, he goes and golfs. And you have to have these things where you sort of put a wall in your life and you put everything into both sides of the wall. But, you know, before we jumped on, you said you're going out to dinner with your wife. How do you compartmentalize sort of the pressure and the moment my moment, like, demands of the Premier League with just trying to, like, make sure that you're in a place to handle it all gracefully. Yeah. I mean, it's mostly with my family. So because the other side of me, you know, moving to Europe is, is that my family, we've been together through all this. And so now my daughter's in university at Glasgow, my son's finishing high school in Salzburg. Our third child is still living with us. 
the reason I said we're going out to dinner is because my Salzburg son is here visiting for the week. So, and he leaves tomorrow. So we're all going out to dinner tonight to have a last dinner before he goes back to school. So, you know, I mean, it's taken uh, full energy in my personal life too, to make sure that our children are taken care of, that, that our family is set up and, and with all the challenges that we've been through of moving to different countries and experiencing different things and new languages and um, that, that we're well supported here and that everything is kind of taken care of at home. So the combination, and balance means that when I'm with the family, there's not really a whole lot of time um, to think about anything else other than us, which is an incredibly wonderful, thankful distraction from the craziness of what the professional world is. Um, and, I, and I've gotten over the years, I've also had to work at that. I've had to really challenge myself to be in the moment, to live in the moment, whether it's with my family or with the team or with the pressure of games and everything, just to like live in the moment, be in the moment, experience it, live it. And then I think, and love that those moments. And then I feel like that's the best way to, to really enjoy your life. How does that flip for your family? Like how do they, did they live and die with Leeds United at this point? Like how do they experience yeah. your profession on their side? I think it's the worst lifestyle for any of us is my wife. <laughs> <laughs> She she has to witness the anguish. Um, oh yeah, you know the what was it with the old CBS? It was the 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 thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. That's what our lives are. You know, we're, we're, more than anything, we're not we're not bored. <laughs> I could see I could so, see like you know, are you going to go to sleep here? You've been you've been laying in bed for the last forty five minutes, just staring off yeah. into space. Like yeah. you, you do need to rest. Like. Yeah, no, yeah no. so we but we try we try to we've had a lot of visitors recently so friends and family that have come and and we we like to share that we, we live a unique lifestyle there's no doubt about it and we like to share it with people um but you know i have to always make sure that it doesn't distract from my ability to to really do work at the highest level because again that's what the demand is i have to be good every day i have to be good every day so i, I always uh like sort of laugh to myself and, and it's probably real in parts and not so real in parts about the like american soccer fans trope of you know when you aren't winning in europe you can't go to dinner you can't even go to the butcher shop like everybody's coming out of the woodwork to tell you hey Jesse, maybe you should not like, let's change our tactical identity. Hey, Jesse, play this guy. Why is he not doing this? You're going to dinner. D is that trope true? Like, are people going to come up to you and say like, yes. hey, great win at and you know, wonderful win at Anfield. But like, how does that work in your life? Yeah. I mean, you become somewhat agoraphobic. <laughs> I don't, I don't like being famous. I don't like walking around. So I'll, you, if you were to see me walk around in town here, I'm always, I have a hat, a hoodie, um, glasses, you know, I'm always trying to be as anonymous as I can. It's almost impossible here in Leeds. Um, but I will say that, uh, publicly the people I describe Yorkshire, which is the, the sort the County that, mm -hmm. that Leeds is in, I describe it very much like the Midwest. So we're two Midwestern boys here. Um, you know, that like people are friendly and they're genuine and they, they want to say hello. They want to have a smile on their face. They want to help you if you need help. You know, we meet people in the dog park or whether it's at the restaurant or walking down the street or at the grocery store, like the positivity has been overwhelming. And, and you know, the time that I have the, the best story is two days before we played Brentford in that last match, we walked to the to the town to, to have dinner. And on the way, there were people honking horns and stopping and we're all leads, aren't we? And, <laughs> you know, and, and screaming and we're all behind you and we're all with you. I mean, it, it was it was a special moment. And. And I, that was one of the things in general about the job is, is I don't want to let the people down here. I know how much they love the club. I know how much it means to the community here. Um, you know, so the, so much of, of trying to do the job in the best way I know how is about making sure that this community gets what they deserve. And that's a really passionate team to, to root on and, and one that stays in the Premier League. That's a that's the end goal here. We'll get to that in a second. But I read a quote from you, um, I think before Liverpool, which is if you're a real leader, you're focused on your people. And that's been a theme sort of in, in your coaching career throughout. How does that manifest itself within your team during the four game losing streak that you had? Well, listen, I mean, it, my um, my my real philosophy behind coming to Europe was to see if my version of leadership 
could function in in the most competitive league and sport in, in our sport or, 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 or competitive world. Um, and so I've often said that, whether it was Austria, Germany or, or England, and, it, and it's it's manifested itself in different ways at different places, partly because how the culture works within a, within the team. Um, but for me, it's it's about communication. It's about relationships, it's about investment in people. It's about challenging people to grow and, and get better and be the best versions of themselves, especially when things are hardest. And football becomes the platform for me to do all of those things. So I love foot, being a football coach. I love, you know, I love working on tactics and training and thinking about new ways of, of helping players develop on the pitch. But so much of my investment of what I do as a leader is about getting to know them as people and, and really challenging young men to grow and to understand um, how to be selfless, how to give to each other, how to believe in something bigger than themselves in a very selfish world. <laughs> Very egotistical, yeah. selfish, sometimes awful world. But I find that the more that you can do that effectively, that you you can be really surprised by by what you can achieve. So, yeah, I mean, there's been times where I've doubted doubted myself in that um, at different places I've been. There's been there's been major challenges by individuals and environments. Um, but I've always tried to stay positive and believe in myself and believe in and that identity and that philosophy of, of people. Um, and I will always do that. I won't let I won't let this business make me jaded. I won't go negative. I I refuse. I refuse. So um, that's that's at the core who I am and who I want to be. So is that what you are sort of trying to emote to your players in that moment? Like, you know, because it's hard yeah, for everybody. It's not just it's not just hard for you. They're feeling that pressure you know, just as much. Well, I mean, it's, they, you know, they, they wind up watching me. They wind up looking at how I respond to wins, losses, successes, failures, difficulties, um, individual uh, responses, um, training every day, video sessions, you know, like we're, we're very interactive here in almost every way. I, I walk around the training center every day and I talk and interact and see people and whether it's the, the, the security, the janitors, the kitchen staff, or the academy people, the players, the academy players, whatever. I want everybody to know me and know that I care and I want to know them. And, and I, you know, so names are important. Um, families are important. We just had a Halloween party for all the, the players and physios and first team staff on Sunday because that had never been done before. And those kinds of things mean a lot to me. And what'd you go as? Age. What'd you go as? I went as, I went as, um, um, I wore my later hosen. So ah, I mean, okay. I, yeah. That's... <laughs> my wife went in the closet. Now, you know, just yeah. Pull it right out. That's your lazy yeah. Halloween. Uh, that, it, was, forever, it, was right? little, like... I, it was a little lazy. But you're right. Yeah, but it's a good one. We, you always but it have was it. okay. It was okay. And then my wife was uh, Maleficent or whatever. It's one of those Disney characters. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I can. Remember yep, I remember that one. Yep. But every the guys, all the families dressed up. They all, you know, the kids were all. I mean, it was really great. It was really great. So these things make a difference. These things make a difference. And it, that's why it's so much about the process. It's not just about one game, uh, one month. It's about now building something that's bigger than, than, than what it, what it has been and investing in people. So I could talk about this for hours. Andrews. Yeah. So I, I look at the underlying numbers because I'm a nerd in that way. I don't know if you are as well, but, uh, and I've heard you say we've been unlucky and, and the numbers, the numbers reflect that. How much do you take a look at that and how do you judge performances against results so far? And whether or not there is any change tactically or from a personnel perspective, like what do you expect from yourself and the team through the rest of this very, very long season? Well, I'm very data uh, driven and metrics mean a lot to me. Uh, and and but then it's always about trying to read the metrics for uh, to find truths, not to create stories. Yeah. Um, and that's the that's the tricky. Felt like a little dig it's, at me right there, Jesse. No, 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 no. I'm creating no, no. stories, I, though. I won't deny. It. Yeah, but 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 that's the that's the part that becomes the most relevant is is how to use data to actually um, define what you're trying to do. Uh, so 
even when people talk about expected goals, like I've had people explain explicitly what expected goals are, and I still don't understand. And I don't understand why one company has a certain uh, expected goals value and another a, a different one. So I, I think we all accept expected goals as a as an actual fact and and a and a pure data. Um, number within our within our world, but I still don't know how accurate it but it's a, is. But it's a broad parameter. Like you can interpret yes. that that story as being told in multiple ways. I completely but, agree. But we we hold our we have we hold our own uh, data. So we 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 track our own statistics, and then we use um, try to use consistent based uh, statistics to look at what we're trying to achieve. And in and in this moment, it was to to make sure that we understood that we were on the right path, right? Mm -hmm. And if you looked at metrics at any level, we would have been in the top half of the league at the very least, and then sometimes even in the top six. And so for me, it was about now trying to understand how to modify our tactics and, and our, our substitutions, our, our lineup choices, everything, and then, and then still provide enough consistency uh, so that the players understood that we were doing well and that it, eventually it was going to pay off and that we needed to continue to push even harder in the direction that we were going. Um, so that's still the case. You know, the one, this one victory, which is a big victory, doesn't really change that at all. Uh, you have these reams of data, I'm sure, from all your stops. And it was important to Red Bulls. It was important in Salzburg. It's remained important. Uh, and a lot of it, I assume, is on physical capacity as well to press and run and do the things that you're asking can anyone has anyone surpassed what Brendan Aronson is and can do within that sort of parameter? Like just from a physical capability to run and press. Yeah. I mean, is no, he number yeah. one on that list or have other people surpassed that? I mean, I've had a few guys that are, are at a high level for that, but he's certainly one of them. And Tyler is too. Um, I mean, it's the reason why we went after both of those guys, right? It was because I, I believed in their talent and I knew them, but I also knew in their ability, their ability to play the way that I wanted to play and that we want to play. Um, so uh, they are gifted that way, uh, but they are, they are also relentless in the commitment to get better um, and to develop as people and as players. And, where, does this, and they, where does this come from, this capacity? It's an Americanism. It's an Americanism. I'm sure of it, right? And they're... Um, I mean, it, in some ways for both of them, like when they landed, they played for me, right? For Tyler, I was the assistant and, and, and Brendan, I was the, the, the head coach, but um, you know, they, they, they kind of Philly played a version of what we were doing in Salzburg, obviously New York did for, with Leipzig. And so it was a little from a stylistic and, and from a philosophical football, philosophical standpoint, it was a little bit easy for them to adapt based on some of the terminology and the ideas that were behind the tactics. But th those two, but it's not just being American. Those two are very unique as well. They're very unique personalities in that they, they are relentless to in, in, in their self-belief. They are fearless. Um, you know, I mean, Brendan's Brendan's been a Liverpool fan all of his life, and this was a big moment for him to go to Anfield, and it was a big moment for us. And and it, you, you wouldn't have known that for a second because his uh, self belief and his ability to put it to practice, no matter what the situation, is very special. Um, and the and the best part is is that for me, Tyler has been the best that I've seen him ever in his career. And I've known him for a long time. So yeah, it's been great to see those two. And they're certainly, uh, I think, playing at the highest level of their careers right now. So on Brendan, I think about him in terms of at each stop in his career, you sort of mentally establish like, oh, can he get to this level? Or is this a ceiling for him? And to me, Brendan's career, and it's still so young, is just a series of shattering ceilings and being like, what you thought I might be capable of is actually just a scratch on the surface of my career. What is in your mind? Is there a ceiling in your mind for Brendan? Is there something? What, what are you working on with him right now to help him, you know, whether it's break that next one or get to that next one or whatever it is, what is going on internally to help him improve? Well, I think uh, one of the things was, you know, he, he went through a little stage of, of having a little self-doubt. Right. And 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 then I kind of like had a conversation with him about reinforcing exactly who he is and what he is. And and part of that conversation, I was saying to him, you're 21 playing in the in the Premier League and you're one of the most important players on your team. <laughs> you know, like what an incredible bring it, bring it back to basics. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what an incredible accomplishment already. But 
um, you know, just to, to continue to, to know that he's doing well and he's going to be rewarded for his personality and for his, for the way that he goes about his work every day. And then with him, it's, it's, it's so much just about his ability to make final plays and slow himself down a little bit in the last third. And, and he has more quality than people think he's a good finisher. He's, he's really clever with how to put passes together in tight spaces. And so even the conversation I had with him, I think was before the palace match, and then he put that that play together where he weaved through the box and hit the post that led to our first goal. So um, he will. I know this about him. He will. He gets better every day. It's like you, he's like a weed. It's like you almost see him growing before <laughs> your eyes. It's really amazing. He's a, he's a, he's a special young man. Okay. It, uh, it's it, like looking back on it, I guess it is surprising and not surprising in some ways. Some of the outside chatter about Tyler going to the Premier League and say, oh, can he handle that level? Like the last season at Leipzig wasn't his best, et cetera, et cetera. It seems silly now in a lot of ways, given his performances. What uh, What is your your point of view right now on what's making him thrive? And as you said, play at the best level of his career. He's clear. He's committed. He he. We have a good relationship. He knows he's valued. He understands the way we want to play. And he's driven to be the best right now. And, and you can, you can see it. I mean, for me there, we haven't played against any opponent that's had a better defensive midfielder than, than how Tyler's been playing. Um, so I think his, his upside continues to be massive. A big part of him, with him is just keeping him healthy and not overexerting him because, um, that's always a, a little bit with him. An issue is the, sometimes the travel back and forth, sometimes playing too many games in a week, has led him to to have back issues and calf issues and things like this. So, you know, I've been very um, careful with him and very clear with our medical team on, on that we need to to modify him at times and really control his loading. Um, but this is, you know, when you ask about the 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 run data that we have versus. You know, we have the fewest muscle injuries in the Premier League and we run the most. And, and and that was the same at Leipzig and that was the same at Salzburg. And so it's a lot about the methodology of training, about loading, about measuring players, about what they do in the gym, what they do with nutrition, what they do in their personal lives, like making sure at all levels that we treat them like Ferraris and, and that they're fine tuned in, in every way. And the more that we're able to do that, the more they're able to perform at their optimal level. Did I see uh, uh, to go back to some of your other stuff? Did I see Aurelian Kalen hanging out in Yorkshire yeah. recently? Yeah, yeah, Aurelian's been around. Chris Duval was here. Um, Bradley Carnell has been here. Oh, um, St. Louis City fans are saying, "Oh, okay." okay. Yeah, I'm trying to. We've had I, 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 there's more. Um, we've had quite a few MLS uh, and former players of mine stop by that are now getting into coaching which I'm, I'm really proud of, of a lot of those guys. Damien Parnell has visited me a bunch. Ronald Zubar has visited me. Oh, God. I check off the could, just uh, Red Bulls fans and MLS nerds just checking off the list right now. I could go down the list, but I've seen a lot of the guys. And, and I'm, I'm really proud of a lot of them and how, how inspired they are by becoming coaches and, and you know their desire to try to help make a difference in the game. So, um, yeah, and it's always great to see him, and we share such great experiences together and, and great successes. So, yeah. I loved what you said about uh, sort of being yourself and not apologizing for that because ultimately that is, you know, throughout your life, that's that's where success comes from is being authentic to who you really are. You are, yeah. I think right now, may, maybe the only American with a, a job, certainly at the level that you're at, does any part of you feel like or feel like you have a responsibility that you're flying the flag for American coaches? Don't do that to me. <laughs> I'm, I'm just asking the question. You can say no. That's I fine. know. Well, people say it all the time. Um, and I guess I understand it. Like Bradley Carnell came and he was like, listen, it's so important for you to do well for all of us. And like – I don't, first of all, I don't need more pressure. Yeah, so that's tough. Yeah, that's tough. <laughs> and second of all, that's – it's not on my mind. Like I'm not a grandiose thinker. Right. I, I it, and like, if I want to lead and be selfless, then I better make sure that my behavior and my mentality is such, but truly, I mean, I I'm very, I'm here because of my relationships and experiences that I've had in this game and mostly from people, right. People have helped me get here. I wouldn't, I could go down the list from when I was 10 years old in my, where I grew up in Racine, Wisconsin, and the coaches that, that, that believed in me and invested in me all the way through my college career to my professional career to then my move to Europe to the players I played with to the people I have in my life. Like 
they've all impacted me to be able to do this at this level. And, and that's what it takes. It's like, it, it, it takes a village to give a, I always say there was a 0.0% chance that I would be coaching in champions league or coaching in the premier league from where I'm from and what football meant to, to Racine, Wisconsin. Right. And by the way, it's soccer there. <laughs> yeah. I was going to, Hey, you look, you know, you had a code switch when you're in Racine, yeah, it's soccer, exactly, when you're in exactly. it's, it's football all day. Every but, day. but the point is, um, it, you know, it, it's, there's not a pathway for us. There's not. And the reason I'm here is it's a, it's a, it's a random collection of experiences and luck um, that, that, and, 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 and relationships really of people that believed in me from Gerard Houllier to Oliver Mintzloff to Ralph Rangnick to, to Bob Bradley to, you know, we could go down the list. People that believed in me, they really believed in me and they gave me a chance to invest they invested in me and they gave me a chance to invest in myself. Um, so um, if the byproduct of me being here and hopefully being successful is that more people have the, ch the opportunity, then that would be really great. And that would make me proud. But, but, but let's I, not he, let's not put it on your let's not make you Atlas. Please don't coaches, please right? don't do that to me. I'm, please I wasn't trying to. I'm not trying <laughs> to. I can now blame it on Bradley. I didn't say okay, it. Good, good. So I good. like that you mentioned Bob there because that's where I was headed next with the World Cup. And I, I'm sure Leeds fans are like, hold on, hold on, we'll take more. Uh, but you know, I think it, if I remember right, it was 2010. Was it February 2010 that you came on, or maybe a little earlier, came on board as an assistant coach for the US men's national team ahead of that World Cup in South Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me about what that, that opportunity within your coaching career and life to be a part of that process as we now look ahead to, uh, as of today, November 1st, 20 days until mm -hmm. Wales, U.S. and Qatar. Yeah, yeah. So um, it would have been January uh, because I was in the January camp. Uh, that was my first experience as the assistant coach of, of the national team in 2010. And so much of the work had already been done by Bob and his staff. So they had already qualified. Uh, they had already done really well at Confederations Cup. And really now it was six months where he felt that he needed one more person in the staff to help kind of be a connection between the players and the, the staff and the training and the, you know, the preparation. Um, Mike Sorber was in St. Louis at the time. I could be in LA and really work intensively with Bob every day. It's not to say Mike wasn't as well, but he was re more remote. And we did now, we just got to work on evaluating all the players over that five month span to see what kind of form they were in. Uh, obviously, the core of the team had kind of already been built. So it was pretty obvious already who nine of the 11 starters would be, what, what 17 of the 23 man roster would look like, but it was about now making sure that we could keep track of the form of all of those players and, and then evaluate where to fill in the gaps for what exactly was necessary for the, for the roster to do well in the tournament. Um, it was a, a, a great job. Uh, I'm, I felt really lucky. It's the best job that, that a young coach could have. It's at the highest level in terms of preparation and, and attention and focus and concentration and discipline and, and work um, to prepare for a World Cup. Um, and I think we did a great job. I really did. I really do. I felt uh, it, it was uh, a real strong group. I think the preparation leading up to the World Cup, which Greg and his staff won't quite have, as you've mentioned, we did things like we we had uh, Bill Walton come to the team, Dan Gelada, the, the the helicopter pilot from Black Hawk Down. We we went over videos of Les Yeux Don Les Bleus, which was the 1998. Uh, French team before they won in their documentary. We did the, the the road to redemption. We did we prepared the tactics. We talked about the opponents. We from every level we were very analytical and I think very clear as to exactly who we wanted to be once that first ball was kicked. And I think that had a major part of our ability to win the group for the only time ever. So yeah, England was in that group. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, how? How limiting is it for for Greg and his staff when they don't get to make this choice? This is just the way the logistics work for this tournament, that they don't have that that pre-camp. Like, they've got the well, most players in Frisco right now, but they don't have the full group together one more time really yeah. in the lead-up. It's like, you go to Qatar, and, and you got to get it done. No, I mean the, the 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 obviously everybody's on the same playing field when it comes to that, right? So nobody really has the full preparation that you would normally have. However, I think – for the American team, yeah. and the good thing is, is that 
So the, the, for the American team, what is so important is the, the, the gritty, unified feel of the team that they can achieve the impossible. Right. That winds up being even more important than the tactics and the football. And the it's that the group believes in the fact that they can grind it out and do whatever it takes against the best teams and the best opponents in the world um, and best players. And so, you know, I, I, the benefit Greg has is he has this young group of players that are fearless, that love playing with each other, that have now been together for four years or uh, five and I love that 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 Greg and the and the the federation has committed to this youth project and not just played the same old old players again. Um, and I and I believe they've been rewarded for it, and I believe they will continue to be rewarded for it. So um, it's obviously a, a little bit challenging because there won't be a big group of players in the squad that have World Cup experience, and there's still a lot of value to that because when the games get started, it's it's heavy. It's really heavy. But I, I, I believe that their fearlessness and their Americanness will help them through that. You said fearlessness, and I was going to go to this quote next, so it's a perfect transition. Um, Paul and Sam over at The Athletic did a, a narrative podcast, and this is one of the quotes therein from Greg, which is, when you don't have fear, you're much more dangerous. If we can get our group to play without fear, we will be dangerous. How do you get a group to play without fear? Well, I mean, you, you do it by creating a foundation of belief. Right. That's the most important thing. And that that is, again, that's that's the tactics in the football. But it's it's also the the mentality and 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 the clarity at which everybody understands their role and everybody believes in each other. And how much these things matter, how much they like each other, how much they are willing to do anything to fight for each other, to to be ready when the moments get tough, to stand tall. And and listen, they've they've had enough tough moments already. It's it's whether it's been COVID or whether how qualifying goes or whether it's playing away or whether it's the criticism that they take, because in this day and age, this is what being the national team coach and the national and national team players. That's what it is, is it's full of a bunch of uh, needless, ridiculous, <laughs> negative criticism. I was wondering um, where you're going there, but yes, I, I yeah, agree with that. I think I think I was pretty clear. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, um, but, well but said, this is this is the world we live in now, um, and and it does your job as a, as the leader is also to help it make it a unifier on the inside and not a divider. Um, so that will be a big task for Greg and his staff, is and 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 guys like Tyler Adams and Christian Pulisic and guys like this to make sure that in all ways that they are all taking care of things, uh, so that everybody knows that that you're stronger together. Uh, as I heard you talk about the build up to 2010, I I have to ask you because I've thought a lot about 23 versus 26, and I'm sure that that coaching staff would have loved to have 26, but you didn't. Um, do you remember the hardest cut you made in 2010 uh, as a staff? And then do you remember who would have filled potentially those three additional spots if you had them? I know that's we're harking yeah. back to days gone by here, but I, I'm just. Yeah, curious. listen, this is one of the toughest moments of my career, of my coaching career uh, was we played in Philly against Turkey, was it or was it? In, no, it was in Hartford. I think it was, it was Red. I think Red Bull Arena was Turkey because I, I was I was at that game. Nope. No, Turkey no, that was in lead up to 2014. Tilly, this was in Hartford. We had a match against I can't remember who. And then after the match, we had to submit our squad, and we sat until like two in the morning. And then at two in the morning, we had to call players down out of bed. Um, Sasha Kleschen was one of them. And Sasha was, you know, was I was a teammate of his and and uh, I was the one waiting outside the room as they all kind of filed down before I kind of ushered them in one by one to speak to Bob and the rest of the staff. And I didn't feel right about just standing out there and saying, hey, you're waiting. I mean, it, it was clear that it was a big moment. And I kind of said to all of them, listen, you're, you're not going to make the squad and, yeah. and, not, and you'll get a chance. But I, I couldn't just sit there and not say anything. Yeah. And, and one of them was Sasha and we like cried together, you know, and it was painful, painful, but all, all of them. I mean, whether it was Heath, whether it was Chad Marshall, whether it was, um, there were a lot of guys that, um, there were very, t uh, Robbie Rogers, oh, uh, those, that was, those are some tough, tough moments for me and, 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 and broken dreams for a lot of guys. So yeah, not easy.
2-1 uh, U.S. win against Turkey and Philly, and then the East Hartford game, just because I'm a nerd in this way, uh, Czech Republic was That's a win right. by the Czech was a win by the Czechs in uh, in 2010. So, um, all right, let's uh, let's dig into uh, to England here because you guys played England first game of 2010, one one draw. We all remember the Clint Dempsey moment uh, as well as the Rob Green moment that accompanies that. One, what did that mean to you and a staff as a team? Like first game of the World Cup, England. We're getting ready to build up to another game sort of like that uh, more than a decade later. What, what did that game mean to you guys and how did you prepare for it? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there was a lot of talk about 1950 before. I think the, there's a really healthy respect from the, from the American side about what the game means in England. And certainly when you looked at their squad, you thought, wow, this is a really good team. Now the lead up to the World Cup, England wasn't in great form. And actually, I went to watch them in one of their last matches, a warm-up match against um, one of the South African club teams, and they were terrible. Um, they wound up winning like 1-0, but it was they were terrible. Um, they weren't sure who to partner up front uh, with Rooney. They weren't sure what midfield pair to play in the middle. Um, and so you could sense that there was tension in, in, in their team. And then from our perspective, um, we liked our team. Uh, we liked our group. We thought it gave us a chance, but we knew that first game against England was massively important. And there's all kinds of statistics that if you don't get points in your first game, your, your likelihood of getting out of the group just goes way down. So, um, you know, we, we knew that the toughest game was going to be the first one and we knew we were going to have to be ready for our best performance. Um, the, the group also had the Confederations Cup to draw on, which I think was really important. Everything from understanding what it was like in South Africa to what the what the Vuvuzelas were like to play in front of. I mean, there was a, a lot of little things that I think the Confederations Cup really helped the team have confidence and, and understanding as to what the game was going to require. And I think that served us well in that match actually. And in some ways it felt like we were even more prepared and better. And we did, and we had less pressure than England had in that match, which is maybe one of the reasons why green made the mistake, right? It could, could be things like this. Um, and in the end, I actually think with Josie hitting the post and the way we played down the stretch, we were a little bit unlucky not to get more out of that match. So um, yeah, that was, that was, a that was, that was important. Seems like there are some similarities, at least in form right now for this England team, but you're getting a close look at this player pool. On England side, every single week on the club side, uh, what's your scouting report for us? How do you think U.S. and England match up? Yeah, I think it's a really tough matchup. Really tough. Uh, I think Gareth Southgate's done a really good job with uh, instituting a style of play and in a, in, in a way that they want to think and do things. Um, and then I think that they have incredible quality, right? And players that play at the highest level every every week, uh, twice a week. <laughs> Harry Kane's an incredible form for me. So this will be a big part of the task on the day is, is how to manage taking care of him. Um, you know, Cal, Cal, I know, obviously I've got to know Calvin Phillips now. So the defensive midfield uh, position is a little bit open. The The other strikers other than, than Harry Kane is a little, that's a big talking point right now here in England is who else is going to make the squad and which guys that could partner well with Harry Kane. So they still have some questions to be answered. Um, but certainly when you look at a quality perspective and an individual um, um experience level and playing at the highest level every week they they're they're one of the top teams in the world right now u.s has some questions that we've been trying to answer and injuries are always a a bummer and it just seems like headline after headline of, of sort of like core guys are like oh hey niggling this tight you know tight hip here etc cetera, etc cetera. um and this is a hard question to ask you and i know that i just i'm curious what you think the expectations should be for this team like is should we be as a as, as a fan a fan base coming into this saying and, and a country saying we have to get to the knockout round because that sort of feels like the prevail, prevailing thought H how should we be thinking about that we should be optimistic right and mostly because i think the group is challenging but it's not impossible right it's a little bit like 2010 we knew we had a every it puts it almost puts more pressure on you if your if your group is is a little yeah. bit weaker yeah, because like, oh, then the easy. expectations yeah. grow but yeah, you know that every country in the world, the the eyeballs are fully on those matches and the importance that it it it, it how it weighs on on every team and every coach um, is big. But um, listen, I think 
Wales is a good team. I, I know some of the players on the Welsh team. They're good players. They're, they're, they're a team that's really committed to each other and has really good team spirit and has some high talent. So that, that won't be an easy game. Iran, it, it's impossible for me to know anything about Iranian football other than the top, a few of their top players can play in Europe and are, and are quality players. Um, yeah, so I, I think that obviously everybody's optimistic that we can get out of the group, and, and I, would, I would like to see us get out of the group as well. How will you watch it? This is going to be a, a big EPL break. How will you? Will you have? Be, uh, will, will the yeah. Salzburg Sun come back? How will you? Uh, yeah. How will you experience this tournament? We are going to Peru for my best friend's wedding. I'm the best man at his wedding, um, so I think I'll be in Peru, maybe in Cusco, getting ready to go to uh, Machu Picchu um, that day, watching uh, England U.S. So um, it's a busy day. Yeah, it should be cool. Uh, it'll be interesting. But, yeah, I mean, I'll obviously watch every game, and I'll try to watch as much as the World Cup as possible. But I'm always – you know, we'll have our USA gear on. We'll have our scarves and hats and everything, and we'll be rooting rooting the guys on for sure. I want to talk about Aaron Long just because you have so much time and experience with him, and, and we talk about unfair maybe or over-the-top criticism, and Aaron has been a target of a lot of that. Uh, over the course of, of the last year or so with the U.S. Help people understand from a coach who's coached him, who's relied on him, who's put him in high leverage moments repeatedly over and over, what makes him a player that coaches like yourself and Greg Berhalter rely upon? Yeah, well, I think he he's a player who has a lot of gifts and in many ways has no weaknesses. For him, a lot of time it's about – what is he in through with his injury and form situation and just trying to manage that because he's he's had some bigger injuries and then he's had some little injuries. So like developing a rhythm in his game, then the way that Red Bull asks him to play is a little bit different than the way that the national team asks him to play. So for all the players transferring back and forth from playing styles and tactics isn't always the easiest. But the person, the person that is Aaron Long is one of my favorite people I've coached because he comes with energy every day. He um, is not afraid of playing against the best players. He's gifted enough to handle almost any situation. Um, he's good in the air. He's good on set pieces, offensive, defensive, so he can be a threat uh, offensively as well. He's a good passer. He's fast. When he's fit, when he's at his best is when you really see all those qualities come out. When he's not always in rhythm, when he's not uh, uh, 90 minutes fit all the time, then that's when you start to see more mistakes. But that's the case of almost anybody. So for him, really, it'll be how fit is he, how strong is he, and how ready is he to perform at that level. Uh, we'll finish up here in a second. I have dinner. But I saw in the Champions League broadcast today that Thierry Henry said the 2010 generation, he's pointing at Clint, who's at the table with him. Uh, and I think Maurice was there and, and Mo and, and I think Charlie too. That the 2010 generation of the U.S. were more mentally tough than this group of players. You are uniquely positioned to have an opinion on that because you coached on that 2010 team and you've coached and still coach players on this team. What do you make of Henri saying that that generation was more mentally tough? This is a standard generational uh, <laughs> bogus conversation because I always say – How like, long did you walk into Snow to School in Racine though? Like, yeah, I, I know, but my, know. My, on, my, dad's, my dad's generation <laughs> would have said that we're all soft, yeah. right? And then I look down to the next generation we go, oh, they're all soft. They don't know what we went through and blah, 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 blah. Every group – of players and teams and generations has their, their, their strengths and their weaknesses. Um, for me, what this team has is more raw talent. No doubt, no doubt, right? They have more athleticism. They have more um, quality, more technical quality, more tactical quality, more big experiences in the game, playing in Champions League and, you know, playing for big clubs, but they're still young. Right. And and so a lot of whether it's mental toughness, whether it's experience, whether it's understanding what the biggest games are all about um, and, and how to do that when you're 22, 23, 24, 25. And when you've never played in a World Cup, that will be their challenge. That's clear. Right. And, and, and if they can manage that together and find ways to, to play savvy and not naive, to be strong when it's tough and not to crumble, if they can stick together when everybody's got an opinion about everything they're doing instead of worrying about what people are saying. And if they can be focused on exactly the moment and do the job with each other, they have a real chance to be good. 
And that will that in the end will be what what determines their success. Well, Twenty days, uh, I guess. People listening, it'll be the week after this. So next week, it'll be two weeks basically. So the World Cup, we'll see. I have to ask you this: eliminate the time frame. It could be when you're, I don't know, sixty, sixty-five. It could be in ten, whatever. Is there literally any time in your coaching career? Is it a goal of yours to coach the national team? Is that a goal? Yes, yes, that is a goal of mine. Um, it's hard to conceptualize right now because when you're in this job. At, at Leeds United, I have no time. To I say, you gotta, I mean, you gotta have the blinders on. I just, I'm already I wanted, spending. That's, I'm spending way too much time. I was gonna say that's why. That's why I gave you the eliminate the time frame zone. Yeah, yeah. Said, any, no, anytime. But, but yeah, I, I mean, listen, I, I love, I love the sport. I love uh, the World Cup. I love our country. I love. Um, it, it would be an honor. Um, I never, you know, I don't interact with too many people in U.S. soccer, and I have no idea how I would fit in that. That's that's up for them to decide at any given moment. Um, I would hope that I would be considered um, at some point, but who knows when that is. But at any time, it would be an absolute honor, and 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 to take the nation to a World Cup would be a, a, a dream, a dream come true. Let's see how uh, how well you can predict the future. Jim Curtin in the Union or MLS Cup, Steve Trundle and LAFC are their opponent. Who wins MLS Cup? You know, these are two very good friends of mine. I know. I that's mean, why I asked if, you. That's if exactly I were why to, I'm asking you. If I were to pick two current coaches who are my best, the guys that I'm closest with, I would think it would be these two guys. So um, Steve is new in his coaching career, and Jimmy's put a lot into it. I would – Probably I don't. This is so. By saying that, you can tell that I would probably like to see Jimmy get get one this time, um, because I think he's put a lot of time and effort. I've known him a long time, and and I and he's built such a great program there at the Philadelphia Union. And year after year, I think he's done an amazing job. And even you know, I mean, usually it's the Supporter Shield winner that gets Coach of the Year, and I think that Jimmy gets Coach of the Year because the job he's done, and because he's one of the most likable people in the sport. Right, so it works. It works in two ways, I think. Oh yeah. Um, but I, I've been incredibly impressed with Steve and, and how he's taken on a, a quality team and led them and the way they've played football and the way that they've dominated the league. I think it'll be a monumental task for Philly to go to LAFC and win. Like you saw with Austin, they just got dominated. Um, so my, my mind says LAFC, but my heart probably in this moment says Philly. Sorry, well, Stevie. Hey, I so love you, brother. One of, those you, two, one of those two is going to be right. It could be the mind. It could be the heart. Either way, yeah. uh, Jesse, thank yeah. you so much for being generous with your time, man. Always right, a pleasure Andrew. to chat with you. Uh, appreciate right your on, insights brother. and uh, everything else. Best of luck. We'll be watching. Okay. Thanks, man.